Hey guys, this is a re-upload of yesterday's video. Many of you said that you couldn't share it. That's because YouTube age restricted it and took that function away. You should now be able to share this video. God bless. Be sure to follow my ministry on BitChute and Rumble because this channel could disappear any day. Links are in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Back in November of 2020, this ministry conducted a virtual Bible prophecy conference over the internet via live streaming. The theme of the conference was, What on earth is God doing? I spoke about what God is doing in our nation. Today's program is going to be devoted to the presentation that I made at the conference concerning the future of our nation. At the time I spoke, the outcome of the presidential election was still up in the air, but it was my belief that regardless of the outcome, the ultimate fate of our nation would be the same. The election would determine only the pace at which we would encounter that fate. I believe that fate would be slowed by the re-election of President Trump, and I was confident that it would be accelerated by the election of Joe Biden. I still feel that way. Here now is the presentation I made. Is there any hope for our nation, or have we passed the point of no return? Is our fate sealed? Are we destined for destruction? Or could there be a spiritual revival that would turn the hearts of our people back to God? The question is, what is God doing in America? Twenty years ago, at the beginning of this century, my answer to this question would have been, He is calling us to repentance. Today, my answer is very different. My answer today is that He is warning us of His impending wrath. My answer has changed because I believe America is finished. I believe we have passed the point of no return. And for those who think there is no such thing as a point of no return, let me assure you that the Bible clearly teaches there is such a point in history, in the history of a nation. The Bible refers to it in several places as, quote, the point where the wound becomes incurable. Look it up. The ancient nation of Judah is a classic example. Jeremiah declared that its wound was incurable because of its rebellion against God and His Word. And because of that, Jeremiah was told three times not to even pray for the nation. God even told Jeremiah that the intervention of persons as godly as Moses and Samuel could not save the nation from His wrath. Ezekiel was told the same thing. God declared to him repeatedly that the prayerful intervention of Noah, Daniel, and Job would be insufficient to save Judah from his wrath. Like ancient Judah, we are currently a nation in all-out, full-scale rebellion against God and His Word. We have reached that point that characterized the lawless days of Israel during the time of the nations ruled by judges when the Bible says, Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We have abandoned the counsel of Solomon who wrote in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge God. We are far down the road to becoming a mirror image of Noah's depraved society that was characterized by violence and immorality. As in the declining days of Judah, we have become like that nation when God condemned them through the prophet Isaiah with these words, You are calling good evil and evil good. We are, in fact, in the last stage of God's abandoned wrath as explained by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1. In that passage, Paul declares that when a nation sets its jaw against God, he will step back, lower the hedge of protection, and allow sin to multiply, resulting in an immoral sexual revolution, which is exactly what happened in this nation in the 1960s. Then, Romans 1 says that if the nation refuses to repent, God will take a second step back, lower the hedge of protection even more, and the result will be a plague of homosexuality. Thus, homosexuality is not just a sin, it can also be a judgment. And it is a judgment that God has inflicted on this nation. 
Finally, Romans 1 says that if the nation still refuses to repent, God will take a third step back, lower the hedge of protection further, and the result will be the abandonment of the nation to a depraved mind. Folks, that's exactly where we are today. And that is the reason we are hearing constant cries for things that would have been unimaginable only a few years ago. Let me give you some examples. The defunding of the police. In other words, the undermining of the barrier between us and the barbarians. People calling for the emptying of jails and prisons in order to provide counseling instead of punishment. The payment of slavery reparations to blacks. In other words, payments to people who have never been a slave from people who have never owned a slave. The payment of reparations to homosexuals for having outlawed homosexuality in the past and for having prevented homosexuals from marrying. Legalizing prostitution and even pedophilia to consenting children. <laughs> Legalizing all hard drugs as the state of Oregon has just done. Legalizing euthanasia and infanticide. Promoting drag queen story hours for children at our public libraries. Mandating public school curricula that teaches from the kindergarten level that various forms of sexual perversion are normal. Legalizing punishment for hate speech, which would include criticism of sexual perversion and abortion, or even declaring Jesus to be the only way to heaven. Confinement of all vestiges of religious expression to houses of worship, Taxation of churches and ministries, forcing churches and ministries to hire people who disagree with their creedal statements, confiscation of firearms, defunding of the military. Yes, folks, there are people actually making this demand. Removal of chaplains from the military, packing the Supreme Court to assure a liberal majority, a constitutional amendment to abolish the Electoral College, the abandonment of nationalism in favor of a one-world order, the mandatory abandonment of fossil fuels, the dumping of any support for Israel, the revision of American history to disparage our Christian heritage and to present us as the world's greatest evil, replacing the Star-Spangled Banner as our national anthem with John Lennon's song, Imagine, which celebrates atheism and socialism. The list goes on and on and every time I think it could not get any worse, it gets even worse. And what is the church in America doing in response? It has gotten in bed with the world, endorsing homosexuality and same-sex marriage and ordaining both homosexuals and transgenders. Christian spokesmen all across our nation endorsing horrors like abortion and euthanasia. Christian leaders, even some calling themselves evangelicals, arguing there are many roads to God and Jesus therefore is only one of many ways to heaven. Christian spokesmen condemning foreign mission work on the grounds that it constitutes quote unquote cultural imperialism. Christian pastors building their sermons around modern psychology rather than the Word of God. Christian teachers and preachers openly mocking the Bible's outdated, culturally compromised, and full of myth, myth, legend, and superstition. The church today in America is 1,000 miles wide and one inch deep. The average Christian has no idea what the fundamentals of the faith are. Most could not name the first five books of the Bible or the four Gospels. We are in the midst of a famine of the Word of God. It is no accident that the nation's largest church, the Lakewood Church in Houston, is pastored by a person who preaches positive thinking and financial prosperity. Again, the church in America has gotten in bed with our depraved society seeking the approval of people rather than God. In fact, the basic problem of our nation is that we have forgotten God. In 1983, Alexander Solzhenitsyn declared that all the horrors of the Russia under the Communists were due to the fact that the Russian people had forgotten God. And he pointed out in 1983 that our nation was on the same track. This was the fundamental problem of ancient Judah. Isaiah expressed it this way in chapter 37 verse 10 when he wrote, You have forgotten the God of our salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Many well-meaning pastors in America today are preaching 
the hope of national revival. I understand their hearts and I appreciate their hope. But folks, I believe it is unrealistic and unbiblical to believe our nation can return to God. They point to the past when several times our nation grew cold in its relationship to God. And each time people prayed for revival and revival occurred. But there is a big difference today. Our nation has not grown cold in its relationship to God. On the contrary, our nation is in outright, full-scale rebellion against God and His Word. We are collectively shaking our fist at God and mocking Him. To put it very bluntly, we as a nation are not giving God the cold shoulder. We are giving Him the finger. Another reason I cannot believe in a national revival is because I believe we are now in the end times on the way, on the very threshold of the Great Tribulation. And nowhere in the Bible, nowhere is there any prophecy about some sort of great end time revival. It just doesn't exist. Instead, the Bible states over and over and over again that in the end times society will become as immoral and violent and the church will be filled with apostasy and will be preaching doctrines of demons. In 2016, God granted this nation a window of grace with the election of Donald Trump. Despite his background, his very worldly background, and his highly offensive personality, he stood for Judeo-Christian principles in his legislation, regulations, and court appointments. He slowed our nation's descent into the pit of hell. But as our recent national election has just demonstrated, that descent cannot be stopped. It can only be slowed. Evidence of that can be seen in the following facts. First, Despite being the most ungodly president in American history, Barack Obama left office within six, with a 60% approval rating. His designated successor, Hillary Clinton, received 3 million more votes than Trump. Third, the millennials, the future of our nation, supported a socialist in the primaries and then voted for Hillary in the general election. And this year they did the same thing by giving their support to Bernie Sanders and then to Biden. And worst of all, Polls are showing that only 9% of Americans can now be classified as Bible-believing. And even worse, those same polls are showing that only 17% of professing Christians can be classified as Bible-believing. Our churches are full of professing Christians who have never been born again. They are actually cultural Christians who are going to church as a cultural habit. And when the rapture occurs, they will still be here going to church, hearing apostate sermons by deceived pastors who will also be left behind. Even many Bible-believing Christians refuse to face the harsh reality of our nation's future. They seem to think God is, is sitting on His throne wrapped in an American flag with no intention whatsoever of pouring out His wrath on our God-rejecting nation. They are like the people in Jeremiah's time who responded to his calls for repentance and his warning of God's impending wrath by chanting, the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple. What they meant by this chant was that they did not believe God would ever allow the temple to be destroyed where his Shekinah glory resided. And likewise, many Christians today believe God would never, never allow this nation to be destroyed. Well, folks, we need to remember a biblical principle that says, to those to whom much is given, much is expected. Our nation has been blessed more than any other nation in history except ancient Judah. And yet despite our incredible blessings, we have turned our backs on God and we are begging for His wrath just like the people of Judah. And God destroyed their nation. Why would He deal it with us any differently? I went to the Soviet Union in 1991 shortly after the collapse of the communist government. What I found astonished me. All the stores in Moscow were empty. There was no food. There was no clothing. There was nothing. Overnight, the nation with the largest number of nuclear weapons in the world had been reduced to a third world state as tens of thousands of Russians were in the streets with card tables stacked with items to trade because the nation had been reduced to a barter economy and so people were trading clothing for food and food for clothing. And as I surveyed this incredible scene, the Lord spoke to my heart and He said, David, go back. Go back to America and tell the people what you have seen. Tell them how I destroyed a nation overnight and warn them that the same fate awaits America. But even worse, 
because of the blessings I have given your nation. Tell them that to those to whom much is given, much is expected. Well, folks, when I returned, I began to preach that message, and people let me know in no uncertain terms that they did not want to hear what they labeled as a negative message. In the year 2000, I published a book titled Living for Christ in the End Times, and the subtitle I gave it was Coping with Anarchy and Apostasy. That was the year 2000. The publisher refused to use that subtitle. I was told that it was too extreme, too radical. Instead, the publisher gave the book a subtitle that meant nothing at all. When we republished the book in 2015, a revised edition, we took it away from the publisher and we published it ourselves, and I gave it the subtitle that frankly expressed what our society was going to be like, a society caught up in anarchy and apostasy. Can anyone deny those realities today, just five years later? Our nation was based on Judeo-Christian principles. Our constitutional system of representative government was designed with the assumption that there would always be a Judeo-Christian consensus. Our founding fathers stated clearly that if that consensus ever ceased to exist, our Constitution would not be able to stand. Well, my friends, we have arrived. The Judeo-Christian consensus that made this nation great is gone, and our days are numbered. A few years ago, this point was made very powerfully in a brief video produced by a Harvard University Business School professor named Clayton Christensen, who I am sorry to say died of leukemia in January of this year, 2020. Let's hear what he had to say. Some time ago, I had a conversation with a Marxist economist from China. He was coming to the end of a Fulbright Fellowship here in Boston. But I asked him if he had learned anything that was surprising or unexpected. And without any hesitation, he said, yeah, I had no idea how critical religion is to the functioning of democracy. The reason why democracy works, he said, is not because the government was designed to oversee what everybody does, but rather democracy works because most people, most of the time, voluntarily choose to obey the law. And in your past, most Americans attended a church or a synagogue every week, and they were taught there by people who they respected. My friend went on to say that Americans followed these rules because they had come to believe that they weren't just accountable to society, they were accountable to God. My Chinese friend heightened a vague but nagging concern I've harbored inside that as religion loses its influence over the lives of Americans, what will happen to our democracy? Where are the institutions that are gonna teach the next generation of Americans that they too need to voluntarily choose to obey the laws? Because if you take away religion, you can't hire enough police. Pay close attention to that last sentence in that video when he said, if you take away religion, you can't hire enough police. In conclusion, folks, is there any hope for our nation? I don't think so. I believe our fate is sealed. Is there any hope for individual Americans? Absolutely. But that hope cannot be found in a political party or a political leader. It can only be found in Jesus. Because I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I can view the future with very strong hope, and that's because I know that God is in control. Psalm 2 says, and while all the political leaders of this world are shaking their fists at God and telling Him they will do as they please, God is sitting on His throne in heaven laughing. Yes, laughing. He's not laughing because He does not care. No, He is laughing because He has it all under control. For our Creator has the wisdom and the power to orchestrate all the evil of man and Satan to the ultimate triumph of Jesus. Keep in mind too, that the anarchy and apostasy we are witnessing today is clearly prophesied in the Bible as an end time sign. That's the reason that the great pastor Adrian Rogers would often say, the world is growing gloriously dark. Why would he call increasing moral and spiritual darkness glorious? Because it is a sure sign that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. Jan Markell has always put the same thought another way. She says, the world is not falling to pieces. Instead, all the pieces are falling into place. What are we to do as Christians 
What are we to do as we face the increasing chaos all around us, including increasing persecution of both Christianity and individual Christians? We are to remember the words that God spoke to the prophet Habakkuk when he was faced with the same situation. God said to him, The righteous shall live by faith. Specifically, we are to commit our lives to holiness. We are to point people to Jesus as their only hope. We are to stand for righteousness. We are to pray earnestly. We are to proclaim the Lord's soon return. And let's keep in mind the immortal words of the prophet Jeremiah, who when confronted with the horrible destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, the nation, cried out in faith, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Genesis 12 promises that God will bless those who bless Israel, and He will curse those who curse Israel. No president in our history has been more pro-Israel than President Trump. Why then did he lose? It's a good question, and I'm sure that there are a variety of reasons. But let me just share two with you. The first that I would point to is President Trump's monumental ego. Before the election, I warned repeatedly that although President Trump's policies were in accordance with Judeo-Christian principles and should be applauded and supported, his constant bragging about his wealth, his wisdom, and his greatness constituted a danger to himself and the nation because God hates pride. Consider the following scriptures. Proverbs 16.5, Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Isaiah 2.12, For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty, and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. Jeremiah 9.23, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might, and let not a rich man boast of his riches. Proverbs 16.18, Pride goes before destruction. Proverbs 26, 12, Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Folks, these are awesome and somber warnings. Again, God hates pride. We cannot expect Him to bless the prideful person. A second reason for Trump's loss is the, that one of the remedial judgments God will place on a rebellious nation like ours is to give the nation the kind of leader its people deserve. And folks, Joe Biden is the type of ungodly leader that we deserve. Our nation worships money and is wallowing in hedonism. Our focus is on the dollar and sex, and God is turning us over to a leader who will destroy our economy and do everything in His power to promote the sexual perversion movement. We as Christians are facing increasing persecution. The church is trying to avoid it by getting in bed with the world. True Christians will have to face it and stand for righteousness. And that means we will have to lean on the Lord as never before. God is being expelled from the essence of American society. Through Supreme Court decisions starting in 1962, God is being expelled from America. 1962, Engel v. Vital. The removal of prayer in public schools by the Supreme Court. 1963, Abington School District v. Shump. The removal of Bible reading in public schools by the Supreme Court. 1973, Roe v. Wade. Legalized abortions by the Supreme Court. Since then, there have been over 60 million abortions in the United States. 2013, United States v. Windsor. The Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. Doma stated, that one man should be married to one woman. Doma is biblically supported according to Genesis 2.24, which says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. 2015, Overfell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court case that ruled in favor of same-sex marriages. Contrary to the Lord's commands, America has made it illegal to teach about God and to pray to Him in public schools. America has made it legal to murder unborn children and has legalized homosexuality in the form of God's sacred institution, marriage. What happens to a nation that kicks God out? Jeremiah 18, 7-10 The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. 
And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Since America will not recognize God as the creator of all things, follow his commandments and give him the glory that only he deserves. He has left this nation to its own destruction. Proverbs 16.6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. There is no fear of God in America, and the result is a society full of evildoers. When we are choosing to hold on to sin, rather than repent and change, God will not hear our prayers, as we read in Isaiah 1.15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Proverbs 28.9 says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. America continues to do evil and disregard God's moral law, ignore his Ten Commandments, make up a God of our own liking, and continue to do what is right in our own eyes. America continues to lie, steal, blaspheme God's name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, covet what is not ours, and take human life. Jeremiah 30.12 says, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. Occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.